Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. I am your host, Lance White. Tonight's guest is Dr. Raymond Moody. Dr. Moody is a best selling author of 11 books, including Life After Life, which has sold over 13 million copies worldwide. He has appeared three times on Oprah, as well as on hundreds of other programs, such as MSNBC's Grief Recovery, NBC Today, ABC's Turning Point, Donahue, Sally Jesse Raphael Show, Geraldo, and The Joan Rivers Show. Dr. Moody is the leading authority on the near-death experience, a phrase he coined in the late 70s. His research into the phenomenon of near-death experience had its start in the late in the 1960s. So let's uh, get all of those years of experience uh, g- gathered together in one person and welcome Dr. Moody to the show right now. Hello, uh, Raymond. How are you tonight? Hello. How are you, Lance? Really good to hear from you tonight. Thank you so much for having me on the program. Oh, it's believe me, it's, it's a great pleasure to, and an honor to have you here tonight. Um, I, in fact, I just had uh, a friend of yours on the show, Daniel Brinkley, mm-hmm. and he was raving about you. I mean, he talked about the old days and how you encouraged him to do this and that, and, and I thought, well, gee, I've got to, I've got to hear more about that. <laughs> um, well, let's see, where should we start? Uh, now, going back over the decades. You you were really the pioneer for research in this field. Um, what piqued your interest about life after death originally? I can tell you that answer in one word, Lance. Okay. And that is Plato. Um, yeah. I I did not grow up religious. My dad was a military op- professional military officer and also a um, a surgeon. And he had the personality of both of those groups kind of multiplied. Huh. <laughs> and, he, you know, to him, religion was just bunk. And thank God for that, because I'm from the Deep South, and if I had been raised up with that, I would have been even more of a wreck now than I was. <laughs> um, but, um, but so since I really didn't, wasn't exposed to religion um except peripherally when I was a kid. When I went to the University of Virginia and at age of 18 in 1962, uh, mm. I went there to, to major in astronomy, uh, but I had also been very interested in philosophy. And in my first semester at the University of Virginia, one of the first books we were assigned is, uh, was Plato's Republic. And Plato's Republic ends with a near-death experience. And um, Plato was the first person I had ever encountered who took the notion of life after death seriously. Um, Uh. And so, since I was so impressed by Plato, he's still one of my favorite writers, and I guess in the last 30 years, as long as I'm home and, and in my workspace, I'm never more than about 20 or 30 feet away from my complete uh, uh, edition of uh, Plato's works. Mm. And at the end of that dialogue, The Republic, there's this phenomenal story of a man who was believed dead, a warrior on the Mm. battlefield, who had this astonishing experience. Well, um, everybody, of course, who's read The Republic remembers that that amazing um, conclusion to it. And then, uh, three years later, I, I need to say here that I was an honors student in philosophy at the University of Virginia as an undergraduate. Now, I'm not saying that to brag, but just to explain that my last two years uh, at UVA as an undergraduate from 64 to 66, my only duties were to go to my tutor once a week Mm-hmm. and uh, read a paper to him on some philosophical topic that I had uh, that he had assigned me. And then um, I had free reign. I could go to all the graduate courses in philosophy. So during mm-hmm. one of those courses in 1965 called the Philosophical Topics, uh, Professor John Marshall uh, mentioned one evening that right there in Charlottesville uh, at the medical school was Dr. George Ritchie, who was a psychiatry professor there, who some years before had actually been pronounced 
dead on two mm. occasions, about nine minutes apart. His his heart had stopped beating at least for nine minutes. And um, so Dr. Ritchie was very open to talking with students, and he often talked around the, the University of Virginia to various student groups. And so I took that opportunity in 1965 to hear Dr. Ritchie. And, I mean, I can still remember that night just like it was last night. Uh, oh. And the fact that he was such an obviously reliable and deep and warm-hearted man um, uh. who had everything to lose and nothing to gain <laughs> by by talking casually about this, mm. um, he, uh, when I heard it from Dr. Ritchie, that was the first living person I'd ever heard such a thing from. Mm. And it was really startling to me because I realized at that point that it wasn't just an ancient Greek phenomenon. And then, about four years later, after I'd gotten my Ph.D. in philosophy, this was 1969, one of my own students came up after class one day, and a course on Plato I was teaching, actually. <laughs> and I remember, to this day, I remember exactly what he said. He said, um, Dr. Moody, I wish we could talk about life after death in this philosophy course. Huh. And I said, well, why in the world would you want to talk about that? And, again, I can quote him exactly. He said, because about a year ago I was in a bad accident and my doctors said I died. And I oh. had an experience that has totally changed my life, but I haven't had anybody to talk about it with. Oh, now, my. this young man obviously had severe injuries to his arm. He could hardly move one arm. He limped and so sort of almost crawled around sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so the visible evidence of his injury was right there on him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, li and when I listened to him that afternoon, um, he told me identically what I'd heard from George Ritchie uh, oh. about four years before. And at that point, I knew that there had to be more of them. Because if you think about it, um, What's the likelihood that I would have heard the only two of these there were just by, you know, without even really seeking it over a four-year period? Yeah. So yeah. to make a long story short, I just decided to wait and listen. And um, over the three years that I taught at East Carolina University from 69 to 72, quite a number of my students and others in the community, because I started lecturing to various groups like churches and civic clubs around there, uh -huh. and um, began to accumulate a number of cases. And then I, had, uh, I went back to uh, school. I went to the, after that, I uh, went back to medical school to get my M.D. degree wow. in 1972. And, of course, that gave me a great opportunity to talk with lots and lots of people who had these experiences. So that's how uh -huh. it all got started. Wow. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> well, it sounds like you were pretty much uh, guided down a, down that path. <clears throat> Thank goodness for all of us because of the, you know, the enormous body of work that you've created over the years, which, you know, is it definitely helps all of us. Um, well, you know, Lance, actually it all comes from my interest in those ancient Greek philosophers and uh, in 2008, in our society, it's uh, amazing how people generally have lost track of what all that means. But everything that is is essential about the Western society in terms of the logic and the uh, the reasoning process and the accumul accumulation of rational knowledge, it mm -hmm. all traces back to about 19 or 20 or so. Uh, individuals in ancient mm. Greece in the period from about 600 B.C. to about 320 B.C., who mm. really set the whole foundations for the way that we think about uh, everything in, in the West. And, mm -hmm. and those people were involved in the study of near-death experiences mm -hmm. and, um, and the question of life after death. And uh, they were actually accused by many of their contemporaries of of evoking the spirits of the dead. Um, mm. You know, the reason why Socrates got executed was that 
people thought that he was an evoker of the spirits of the dead, like they had at these uh, oracles of the dead or psychomantians at, a, in ancient Greece. So all of my, uh, my um, books and so on, except for my humor books, have come out of that one little uh, period in the first year or so of college where I really got hooked on the ancient Greeks. Hmm. Didn't Plato also mention uh, <clears throat> Atlantis as a real place? Well, I don't know if he mentioned it as a real place or not. Um, oh. Aristotle said that, um, who was a good friend of Plato's and a student of Plato's, and who oh. obviously would in a, be in a position to know, said that the Atlantis story actually began with Plato. And that really does make sense because... Um, Plato often created these uh, scenarios or plausible stories, as he mm -hmm. as he called them, to illustrate philosophical points. And the mm -hmm. the books that in which he talks about the uh, Atlantis or and and created that legend uh, are the Timaeus and the um, Critias. And it's really obvious that what he's the reason he's coming up with that notion of Atlantis, it's his, it's his book on city planning, essentially. He mm. uses um, uh, at, this, at, at Atlantis as a, to, to model his ideas about how um, you should lay out a city, or the mm. ideal city. Okay. <clears throat> well, now, I guess now that said, I, I really should say, however, that um, <laughs> it's possible that he was referring to a legend uh -huh. that uh, um, that he had heard, which is his account of it, that he had heard this passed down through his family. The, uh -huh. And it might have alluded to the explosion of a, of a volcanic island uh, that was to the east of Athens. Uh, uh -huh. Some hundred, several hundred years before that, no, about nine hundred years, as I recall, before that, and so. Uh, but you know, that it, it, it's pretty clear that Plato laid down the legend of of Atlantis as we we have it. Although he might have been relying on other uh, other sort of sources. All right. Um. I guess of all the people <clears throat> alive on the planet today, you're probably one of the few that's fairly certain that there is a some kind of life led by the spirit after death, and that we're basically spirit inhabiting a physical body. Is that accurate? Well, actually, Lance, let me say this. Number one, I think that the question of life after death is the most important question there is. I mean, yeah, absolutely. this is the big one. And yeah. it, it, let's conjecture that there is for a minute. Well, if there is, then that 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 uh, sort of changes everything. Everything. Else. It's yes. the most important thing. It and, is. And all, it is. It really is. It really is. And, <laughs> and because of that, because of that, and because my heroes, like Plato, uh, uh, thought so strongly of this question, and because yeah. they talked about how unfathomable it is, I can tell you honestly and completely with no evasion that my opinion is that reason as we know it is just not set up to give us an answer either way. Uh. And so in terms of being a rational person, I don't know, but I huh. am doing my best to find out. And I can very confidently huh. say this at this point, that in the next few years, we are going to take a step forward in this question that may play out in really interesting and, I think, unpredictable um ways in the future, because the real essence of the question is is that how can we alter our minds and the rational process and the rational structures that we use and that are ingrained in us since the ancient Greeks, can we, can we work with those in a way to give us some entirely new way 
of rational investigation that will lead us toward closer to an answer to that question? And I can tell you absolutely and loudly, yes. And as a matter of fact, I'm saying that to sort of issue a challenge because um, I think I've got a a big part of the difficulty solved. Huh. Yeah, and so I'm getting ready to um, publish well, a book talk, soon. Well, tell us some more about this now that you've titillated us. <laughs> well, um, the, <coughs> the book, what the book does, which I'm hoping to get published first in Europe and then to bring it here. Um, is that it, it takes people through a process in which they actually reformat the mind, the rational oh mind, to oh look my. at the question of life after death in an entirely new way. And oh. I predict, I predict that as this uh, system of thinking gets out and gets circulated, uh -huh. and more and more people work through it. Um, then just by chance, if you think of it, let's say I get several thousand people to work through this, uh, and hopefully over the years, I mean, who knows, over the course of a century, a book can even sell millions of copies. So oh, yes. my idea is that uh, as people read this and incorporate these ideas, that it will shift the way that they talk about their near-death experiences in the future. In other words, these will oh. be people who who've never had a near-death experience, then they absorb this information, and that in the future, when they have near-death experiences, they're going to give some entirely new uh, way of recounting the experiences. Um, huh. I have been working on this for a long, long time, uh -huh. and I think maybe, and I want to underline that maybe with kind of a squiggly line to emphasize the maybe, that maybe it has worked in the sense that I've had one person, a woman, um, who uh, learned all this from me about six or seven years ago, who about a year and a half ago now did have a near-death experience, and it was, she recounted it in an entirely different way than I've ever heard before. Now, really? that said, I've got to say this. Huh. You can't make any sort of conclusions based on one case. But nonetheless, I am confident enough to now to begin predicting that as this gets out, that there's going to be more of these and oh. that we're going to see a whole new way of, um, of recounting the near-death experience, a whole new way that people will have of putting it into words. You know, one of the most common things that people ha say who who have a near-death experience, as they say, I just can't describe it, or right. there are no words, and so on. William right. James, for example, and uh, the American psychologist, psychologist yeah. uh, um, <clears throat> talks about mystical experiences that one of the, the um, chief characteristics of them is that they are ineffable or indescribable. People say uh -huh. that it's beyond our ability to describe them. But now, um, it, we'll just have to wait and see to see where that um, that unfolds after that. But uh, I feel real confident that um, now there's this one step. It's, it's, gonna, it's going to, I, th I think the establishment, if I can put it that way, the people who already have some sort of way of looking at these near-death experiences or they think, uh, you know, this is the way you should study them and so on. This, yeah. this is not going to go down easy with them. But <laughs> nonetheless, because, uh, you know, people get affixed to their old ways of doing oh, things yeah. and so on. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. but nonetheless, I'm, I'm confident enough that I've gotten enough, uh, enough scholars now uh, yeah. who are neutral on the afterlife question but have looked at my work and have uh, said that, yeah, um, they've checked out my reasoning and they think that I'm right. So I'm just mm. going to go ahead and say it. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've developed a, um, a system that takes us a, one step closer to the answer to the question of life after death. What it does is that it removes some of the big boulders that have kept us from a uh, rational um, uh, uh, treatment or investigation of the question of life after death. Well, good. I think that that's a, that's invaluable. You know, I mean, I, I can't imagine anything more uh, positive than that. 
Um, do you have a name for the book yet? Well, yeah, you know, it's a funny, and my, uh, my literary I mean, be... agent came up with the, the uh, name. He calls it um, The Secret World of Nonsense. And Ooh. Uh, I mean here nonsense, not in a negative way, but more in the sense of Lewis Carroll and Dr. Seuss. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and um, you know, some of the, the great thinkers of history, included, including David Hume, who was one of the founders of scientific method in a way because he explored uh, inductive logic and the concept of causation. He lived yeah. in the 18th century in uh, Britain. And um, he and, and many other great thinkers have pointed out that there's a real uh, question here that, um, that, that the, uh, the whole idea of life after death may be unintelligible. That is, we just can't get our minds around it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I've sort of made a breakthrough here and pushed that uh, forward just a little bit. Oh, that's wonderful. Off some of the shackles of that. That's wonderful. Well, I hope that the book is going to be available over here, too, because I love stuff like that. And sometimes, you know, when they're reading something, you can, well, like um, Lewis Carroll, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, he uses quantum physics, but you don't realize that you're reading quantum physics. Oh, yes, you're absolutely right. And some of, a lot of physicists over the years have gone to Lewis Carroll's books, Alice books, for uh, yes. analogies and, and ways to describe these uh, things that don't seem to make any sense in the ordinary common sense way of looking at uh, the world, but yeah. uh, when you study physics, you get into things that are... I mean, whole, look at the whole idea, for example, of um, the shape of the universe we're in. I mean, all ever, probably a lot of kids had the same experience I did when I was about eight or so years old, just kind of going through this process of thinking, well, what's the shape of this thing that we're in? Is it... <laughs> is it uh, does it have a limit in space, or is it infinite? And then yeah. you go in your mind, and you try to go out to the wall at the end of the universe, but then <laughs> yeah. you can always imagine, well, what's on the other side of the wall? Right, so right, that seems, right. So that seems to be nonsense. But on the other hand, the other idea that, that it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever without limit, that's nonsense, too. So we're kind of stuck <laughs> in... Uh, in a um, universe that is unintelligible to us and in some of its most ultimate features. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You, it's almost as if you have to twist the, the universe around into some other shape, like a toroid or a donut. Well, that's you know, right. You, that's right. You know, that's and right. then you can... And Excuse me. You know, then you have the possibilities there. But I prefer the, right. the idea that there are multiple dimensions all interpenetrating the others. That's right. And that's right. That seems to make more sense to me that there are different degrees of matter that are finer and denser, and we happen to be in one of the densest uh, worlds that exist. Well, you know, the, um, the uh, particle accelerator is getting ready to yeah. fire up oh, and uh, get turned. Yes. And uh, we'll, you know, what it, when, the moment they switch that thing up, if it's gone, <laughs> if it doesn't blow up the world, right, it will right. uh, immediately, uh, you know, the, the, our perception of the universe will change because there will be a uh, whole new amazing stuff coming out of that. Oh, yes. Well, they're looking for the God particle, supposedly. And yeah. uh, you know, and then, and and for those who don't know, they are also going to be creating a, a small black hole, not a big one. Yes, yeah, that's right. But who knows what happens when a black that's hole right. is created? <laughs> that's right. That you know, right. it's one of those. Well, we're going to create a black hole. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. We know that a black right. hole sucks everything in that's uh -huh. around it. So maybe we're going to go for a ride. <laughs> yes, you know, I mean, if, if you think about it, that's just so crazy. And it's a, gr a great statement about human beings, too, that we're going ahead and do it in any way. You know, I mean, it's, right. it's just like, uh, well, we got to learn this eventually. So, well, we've got to right. create a black hole. And it may take us with it, but, hey, you know. <laughs> we'll learn something. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, of course, they said that about the atom bomb, and I don't see where there's a great deal of positive... Uh, Exactly. I mean, exactly. I remember when they were getting ready to to test the initial bomb out in New Mexico. Oh. 
Uh-huh. Uh, they were seriously considering whether, when they did it, might uh, set the atmosphere on fire. <laughs> but they went ahead and did it anyway. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, that they made up for it because uh, with their installation up in Alaska called HARP, they can set the atmosphere on fire. <laughs> great. <laughs> so, you know, they made up for their lost time. They figured out how to do that one. <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, where are we going with this? We're just, we're, we can just go anywhere we want. Um, what about, you know, in the, light, in the near-death experiences, people descri- do describe beings of light. And uh, do they dis- what else do they describe on the other side? There's a life review, and I know Yeah, Daniel- people, uh, you know, just, I've looked at thousands and thousands of cases of this, beginning mm-hmm. either in 62 or 65 to be... 65 being the first living person I talked with who had an experience like this. No. But since that time, I've talked with literally thousands of people from all over the world, and uh, it, it's what there seem to be numerous col- common elements, about 50 yeah. or so common elements, and one person may have two or three of them or five or six of them or a dozen of them or sometimes, sometimes people all the way up to the whole full-blown picture. But yeah. basically what they tell us is um, at the point where their heart stops beating or they come very close to death, they uh, get out of their physical bodies, they drift up above, they watch the resuscitation going on down below. Uh, yeah. They tell us they become aware of a passageway of some sort uh-huh. and go through that passageway into some other um, dimension of reality. They say they uh, feel completely taken up in love, comfort, and peace in this uh, Mm -hmm. incredibly bright light. Mm -hmm. Uh, They say they undergo panoramic memory in which all of the events of their lives are displayed around them. Um, To use my word, holographically, everything is there in an instant. Uh, They witness all their life uh, going around uh, around them. Uh, some people say they see structures that seem to be made of light. Um, mm-hmm. And um, then they have some uh, sort of experience where they have to come back. Some say that they were told they had to go back and had things left to do. Others say they don't know why they were sent back. Mm. Um, and... and um, then when they get back, they do. They go through a process of trying to integrate this. It shifts mm-hmm. the life perspective very greatly. People mm-hmm. say that whatever they had been chasing uh, beforehand, that after <laughs> this experience, they realize that the most important thing we can do while alive is to learn how to love. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, they yeah. say that their fear of uh, death kinds of vanishes that, uh-huh. because this experience, to them anyway, is a... Uh, conveys conviction that what we call death is a passage into some other reality. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there seems to be too <clears throat> in during the life review some kind of net. Uh, I don't want to say a judgment because it's not. There's no judgment on that side apparently, but there is a the the experiences are questioned about their. You know, did you achieve, how do you feel about what yeah. you achieved? Yeah. What they're put and, onto the spot about is, uh, is love. Uh, the question is, you know, uh, they say words don't exist in this milieu, but that <laughs> insofar as you can put a word to it, the question that you're focused on is the question of how you have learned to love in this existence. Yeah, because it, yeah. it's kind of played out in reality for you there. It's, you see everything that you have done in your life is displayed there uh, in this undeniable way. And mm-hmm. yet the presence that you're with, this being of light you mentioned, or this completely loving presence, is just sort of helping you through this and is very understanding. So you're yeah. right in that sense that there's not an external judgment at this stage, but they feel that they're doing some pretty harsh judging themselves from time to time because you see the things that you've done and you see the sometimes adverse impact it's had on the lives of others. Um, So the end result is that people say that after 
you go through this review, you really do want to learn how to love. Yeah. However, trouble is it doesn't make it much easier. Uh, <laughs> George Ritchie told me years ago, gosh, decades ago, he said, you know, Raymond, this experience makes your humanity even more of a burden in a way. And what he was getting at is that, as I like to put it, let's face it, it's hard to get the air through the average day without wanting to choke at least one person. <laughs> and you see, that doesn't go away. People say that is that is still with them. Huh. But it just gives them a kind of um, end point or a, um, a goal to keep on yeah. working on. Huh. Even after this, there continues to be development and people try to... Uh, or set off on a life path where they try to integrate and to understand this experience better. And, and some people, like Daniel, for instance, explained that um, he came back with special abilities, that the psychic abilities uh, came back with him, and healing abilities, and he could read people's uh, some thoughts, their lives, and so on and so forth. So apparently, well, I hear that from I hear that from a number of people, quite a number of people over the years, but first person I heard it from was a wonderful na lady named Miss Stokes in Macon, Georgia, in about yeah. 1972 or three, uh -huh. and uh, she told and she was she worked for a, um, a physician who was a friend of mine, my, my father's uh -huh. in, in uh, Macon, Georgia, and uh, she said after her uh, near death experience, she became more empathic toward others and could sort of sense what was going on with people. Of course, I mean, this is very difficult to, uh, to quantify. I mean, you, all of the so-called experiments about EFT right. and uh, so on are, you know, just pseudoscience, really. But right. um, So there's no real way of getting a handle on this by rational uh, means, but um, it, it obviously has a, an impact on people, uh, you know, um, one thing that might be going on here is an experience we call loss of ego boundaries. Um, uh. You know, after people have had an experience like this, where <laughs> they um, uh, realize there's more to life than the narrow path they had been on before, mm -hmm. um, it's it's as though their boundaries kind of get extended out a little bit, and and uh, maybe that's why from their from their uh, perspective, anyway, that it seems afterward they are more attuned to other people. Mm, mm -hmm. I know George Ritchie was, of all the people I have ever known in my life, he was uh, uh, the most attuned to his fellow human beings of any other person I've ever known, and completely kind-hearted and sweet. And um, so in that sense, you know, I can... And then he, not only that, but he um, he was a, a recruit in the Army uh, when mm -hmm. this happened to him in 1943. And uh, subsequently, he took up a career in psychiatry. Oh. And um, so he used his um, the, the insights he got in his near-death experience, then he integrated them into his medical practice. So I think oh, probably yeah. what you saw with George is kind of a combination there of this uh, extension of the ego boundaries together or the extension of the the limits of the self together with just a very sweet and warm kind-heartedness that he always uh, demonstrated toward other people. Huh. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you about, just <clears throat> because it's, there's so much divisiveness over religion on this side of the veil, um, from all the people that go over, are there when they're on the other side? Are there sections that say uh, this is the Mormon section? This is where the jihadists <laughs> go. This is the Southern Baptist. Uh, if you're confused, go through that door. Um, is, <laughs> well, is there I anything that I haven't heard that sort of thing from um, uh, from people with near death experiences? Although that is the kind of account that uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, the 18th century. Um, uh, polymath, actually, he was and studied all the sciences, uh, but he he had visions in which he he gave a, a similar uh, uh, statement, 
And, and George Ritchie even said something like that. He said, um, it's as though um, it, it's kind of divided into regions, but, but not along religious lines. Uh-huh. It's more along, according to George Ritchie, more along, along the lines of the characters of people and, and what they are looking for. Uh-huh. Uh, by uh-huh. and large, I haven't found religion to play that great a role, or, or I should say maybe it plays a more ambiguous role. I've uh-huh. had a lot of people say, who had these profound near-death experiences uh, who say that prior to that they didn't really have any religious background or interest or training. Uh-huh. And then I've had lots of other people from a lot of different religions. And what they generally say is this, that um, they may have to borrow imagery or terminology from their own religious tradition to to try to give others as best as they can a sense of what this experience was like. Right. But... Um, they say that that is always within the limitation that the words really don't describe it anyway. It's, it's something yeah. that lies beyond words, and they're just trying to do the best, the best they can. And one uh-huh. thing I have seen, certainly in all the people that I've talked with, this is, is definitely the trend, is that if they had been affixed to some one religion prior to this, uh-huh. that this experience kind of opens them up to the idea that really there are there is an element of truth in all the great faiths. Right, right, right. Well, that makes the most sense to me. You had some funny stories in your book too. I was reading Life After Life. Um, well, they were funny to me because you have kind of a dry sense of humor, but uh, about uh, people leaving their bodies and, and being shocked or horrified to see you know see themselves looking so gray. What are some of the yeah. funny things that you remember about the stories that you've written? <laughs> well, I had a wonderful friend named Andy Harper. <laughs> and Andy um, was, I met him when it was probably in 1973 at uh-huh. the Medical College of Georgia. He came there to be treated. And I just ran into him in the hall, actually, and just started talking with him. And um, as, because he had ab- obviously had really severe injuries, he had lost both legs and most of one arm, mm. and uh, and a fall from a high tension or from a ha- from a fall from a billboard he was working on onto a high tension power wire. Mm. And uh, Andy told me that um, he sort of came to consciousness mm. after the fall, and he found himself in this uh, operating room. And he saw a big crowd of people in green and everything, just the doctors and nurses kind of crowding around this table. And he said he looked and kind of got up close and he looked to the person who was lying on the table and he said, oh, my God, you know, that poor fellow is just... And, and then it just kind of gradually dawned on him, oh, my God, that's me. <laughs> yeah, so, it, so it is. Um, and, and George Ritchie had the most interesting... Uh, a uh, uh, account of that too. He said that uh, his his experience took place in a military ho- hospital in Camp Barkley, Texas, during uh-huh. World War II. It was September of 1943, and uh-huh. he got out of his body uh, during this, and that he had initially been covered up by a sheet because the the doctor, Doctor Francie, had pronounced him dead, mm-hmm. and the ward boy covered. George up with the uh, sheet, and he said um, that his experience was that he he was there in a ward of soldiers trying to find his body again after this sort of going around, and he, he it was very weird because a lot of the soldiers looked like him. You know, they all had <laughs> um, crew cuts, and a lot of uh, a lot of them, you know, um, well look um, alike. Yeah, they all look alike, and he couldn't <laughs> figure out which body was his until well, he saw the fraternity ring on his oh. finger was what oh. woke him up to that. But the his body had been uh, been covered up. Uh. So George said that he tried to pick up the sheet. You know, of course you would want to, and he said his hand would just go right through it because uh. 
in this out-of-body state, so they can't make contact with the uh, uh, physical object. <clears throat> so did he have trouble getting back into his body? Well, at this point, what started to happen was that the light in the room altered and got brighter and brighter, and then he was surrounded by this panorama of his life, and he was there in the presence of this being that he identified as Christ, reviewing uh-huh. his life. Yes. Okay. So they did it right there on the spot. <laughs> That's, well, he didn't get the trip that, through the... He didn't get to go through the tunnel ride. <laughs> no, actually, uh, George didn't mention a tunnel, and some don't. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's people, as I mentioned earlier, some people will report two or three or four of these things, others hmm. six or seven or eight. Sometimes they go all the way up to the full-blown pr- picture. But, hmm. um, yeah. Hmm. Um, now... I wanted to ask you before it gets too close to the end of the hour about the psychomantium. Yeah. Um, I had heard about this a few years ago, and I don't know whether you were on a show or not. It might have been you, but I just was fascinated with it. It, it was. It well, was it is something... pretty sensational and pretty amazing. And, and to tell, tell you the truth, Lance, if you. This is the kind of thing that this is too sensational for the National Enquirer. I mean, nobody, the National Enquirer wouldn't take this because wow. nobody would believe it. But it's wow. absolutely the truth. And that is that the ancient Greeks had these institutions they called oracles of the dead. They had quite a number of them. Uh-huh. Um, and these are very essential in the, the origins of the Western philosophical tradition. All of the logic we have, everything, really all, all sort of stemmed ultimately in a very important way from these oracles of the dead. And uh-huh. these were underground places where you would go down in there, and they had these various ways of taking you through an experience during which you would actually seem to see and converse with the spirit of a departed loved one. And it wasn't yeah. like a medium, you know, like I'm I'm hearing an M. And right, right. A male presence. It could be an uncle or a grandfather or a brother or a father, you know, with an M. It could be a Michael, a Morris, a Milton, or, you know, but not that kind of thing. But actually you can, in the accounts, for example, of Herodotus and Plutarch, the ancient Greek, Historians, many other ancient Greek sources mm. uh, say plain out that people would actually seem to see and converse with their dead relatives. And um, so, to make a long story short, one of these oracles of the dead was actually relocated and excavated. And by studying what was found there and mm. by combining that with my knowledge of psychiatry, I was able to figure out how they did it and put it together, and it works. Wow. Basically, uh, at the Oracle of the Dead, uh, they had you down there for 29 days, and um, you um, it was in complete darkness, and on the last day you went into this apparition chamber that was about 50 feet long and about a, maybe 10 feet wide, and in there they had this enormous bronze cauldron, and it was polished. Uh, surrounded by a uh, banister, and it was highly polished on the inside and presumably filled up with water water, and then a layer of olive oil because mm. uh, there are plenty of ancient Greek magical recipes that have been mm-hmm. recovered um, that, that show this very clearly, that uh, mm-hmm. they would take a vessel like a silver bowl, for example, highly mm-hmm. polish it, fill it up with olive oil, and in a dark room by candlelight, if you gaze into that sort of um, surface where you don't see any reflection, but it's like gazing into a, an immense optical depth, many mm-hmm. people under those circumstances will see very vivid, full-color, moving, three-dimensional apparitions. Mm. And um, to make a long story short, again, I worked in the from the mid-'80s to the uh, about 1990, I worked kind of building up to this. I mean, it's a long process. You have to do it step by step. But about by 1990, I was ready to do it. So I set up a facility, 
and uh, started taking people through this. All I did was to create a little darkened room in my house and put a uh, mirror, wall mirror up with a comfortable easy chair in front of it and a little mm. indirect illumination behind, and they're in a little cubicle that excludes the light. And mm. then you prepare them by talking with them for uh, just as long as they will about the person that they want to see who had died. Mm. And under those circumstances, about half of them will see um, what they take to be, and I underline that, uh, to be an actual vision or apparition of their departed loved ones. And wow. since that time, many other people have done this. It's um, And it's been reported in numerous journals and so on. So it's uh, not just me talking. I've taught, taught a lot of other people how to do this, and they've had similar results. Now, don't some people go into kind of a past or future, uh, like uh, the projection? Um, well, actually, uh, yeah, you can, just as people do past life regression through hypnotic re regressions, you can do mm -hmm. them this way, too, just by getting the person to gaze into this optical depth and get them to... Uh, uh, to sort of take them back into what they take to be a past life, you can mm. they can see the uh, imagery there in the mirror as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now there's a, another researcher <coughs> who categorizes souls with, with numbers based upon a soul level. Are, have you, in your research, had any indication that uh, your clients or your so the people that you talk to? Are of a different soul age? Is that something that comes up at all? No, I really just that kind of drawing a blank on that one, Lance. Okay. However, um, in terms of the number thing you mentioned, that really uh, I go back then to the Pythagoreans. You know, the uh, Pythagoras who mm -hmm. uh, kind of flourished around 550 BCE, and he was a Greek philosopher who really added the number of uh, the, the concept of number to science. Uh, you know, these days science makes everything a number, right? It's right. You can only it when you can quantify it and put a number to it, then that's where you get scientific progress. And and the person we have who is responsible for that was Pythagoras. He put the uh, the note, and so he um, his notion of the soul was was numerical in a sense. So, and yeah, I would think that certainly Pythagoras, for example, mm -hmm. would have had a notion of the a hierarchy of souls, kind of. Mm -hmm. Even Plato talked about that. That there are some souls that are kind of weighted and heavy, and they kind of hover too much around the um, the physical realm. Where, mm -hmm. whereas if you're a lighter soul and you're uh, in touch more uh, with the uh, the the intelligible realm, as Plato would have called it, called it things that you can't comprehend through your senses or take in through your senses, but you can mm -hmm. only comprehend through your intellect. Mm -hmm. um, a, the famous example of that was Pythagoras, who made an astounding discovery in about 550 B.C. E, and it, it, uh, what he discovered was that um, when you have a liar with several strings mm -hmm. and there's and you pluck two strings and it makes a harmonious sound mm -hmm. then those string lengths will will be related to one another as small whole numbers like one of a, if one of the string lengths is 30 say the other one might be 15 which would be one half right one to two mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or two to one or if then if you have a 30 uh, inch string and a ten inch string, the the thirty would be the, um, the it would be thirty to ten lengths, which would be three to one, right? And he mm. said that harmonious tones were in those uh, those simple numerical relate uh, ratios. Well, the point of that, see, is that up to that point, everybody who was searching for knowledge assumed that what was um, we were looking for was right out on the surface, and we could see it with our eyes and hear it with our ears. But what what Pythagoras proved was 
that something we hear it as a harmony uh-huh. it, um, is really a product of numbers, and we can only comprehend numbers with our mind. So huh. that means that there is a reality, you see, that's um, deeper than the reality that we can perceive directly with our senses. Mm, well, that sure makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, compared to when you began your research, how do you see that our world has changed, and where do you think we're headed? You mean the whole world, not just in context of near-death experiences? Yes, the whole thing, a whole ball of wax. <laughs> well, you can take that any direction you want. <laughs> um, I have sort of lost my power to extrapolate, but in the sense that the world is so complex now. Mm. However, this is my intuition, and that is that there are so many things things now upon us, like the prospect of nuclear terrorism, the global warming, the possibility of a pandemic, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, you know, which is getting closer and closer, eventually it's going to happen, right. uh, and then the, poss- you know, the pandemic would be instantly translated or transmitted around the world through airplanes and so on, oh, yeah. um, that... You know, I hate to say it, but, I mean, it's hard for me to avoid the sense that uh, we're in for some pretty tough times ahead. Yeah. And I yeah. sure hope I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, you know, a lot of different uh, prophecies, predictions, Nostradamus, the Mayans, even revelations all seem to point, and science is looking for an event horizon. Um, so it seems that things are headed in some kind of direction where we're going to be... It does. I don't put yeah. much stock on the psychic areas of things because that's yeah. always been... You know, you go back through history and there have always been psychics or religious figures who say, oh, it's going to be this day or that day. And look, it's never happened. Right? It never does. But, no, no, that's right. Um, no. However, I'm talking about a different thing here, and that's just that I think that... A rational person looking at all the stuff um, that's going on and, and was knowledgeable about some of the difficulties we face right now would, I think, would have to say, and says, uh, unless there's some amazing new discovery that pulls us out at the last minute, um, yeah. it seems like we're going through, we'll be going through a very rocky time in the Earth's uh, history here. In the yeah, it does see a way to it. Mm-hmm. It does seem that way. And well, let's hope that we're wrong. Let's hope that yeah. we're wrong, Lance. Well, we made it this far, haven't we? <laughs> we have. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still not in the afterlife. So, and you know, right. one thing that astounds me about it, and I agree with you, I think it's the most important question any of us could ask ourselves, mm-hmm. and it should be like spread like wildfire across the globe, because it really is, if that's not resolved... Nothing else really will fall into place, but once you have that question somewhat resolved, then a lot of other things can fall into place. So I just think this is a wonderful area to, for people to look into. And, oh, and, yes, uh, the most important question. And, you know, Plato said in his dialogue, the Theta, which is the first surviving um, rational, systematic work about the question of life after death, Mm-hmm. Uh, Plato said, in effect, that anybody who doesn't take this question seriously, in mm-hmm. Plato's mind, is almost not worthwhile to be counted as a human being. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he yeah. said it was just that important. Yes, yes, absolutely. Huh? I agree. <laughs> I really do agree <laughs> with that. Well, Raymond, um, let's see. Uh, I'd like for people to be able to find out more about your work and be able to get your books and things. Do you have a website that uh, you I can do. tell us about? It's called, I do. It's called lifeafterlife.com. Okay. Yeah. And um, are you going and to I'm be... I'm going to be putting some of my humor works on there pretty soon, too. Oh, I've wonderful, because uh, you have a great sense of humor. Well, thanks. I was I always wanted to be a humor writer, and, and beginning in childhood, I wrote a lot of humor books, and I'm getting ready to put some of them out now. I've got 
a little book on the illnesses of the afterlife, for example. Oh, like oh, what wonderful. kind of illnesses people encounter on the other side, like oh, phantom <laughs> genital syndrome, where they feel like they're all the way out of their bodies except for that one part, <laughs> or uh, dislocated halo. Uh, is <laughs> <laughs> or uh, yeah. or soul sickle flu. Sometimes you see people that are just shivering up there in yeah. the afterlife, and, uh. and uh, the trouble is their their bodies are frozen in vats back in California, but uh, their souls are on the o- over on the other side. Oh, so they're always goodness. trying to get through to mediums to tell the mediums to get their relatives to go to the place where their bodies are stored and switch off the electricity. Oh, how funny. Oh, I've got to get that one. Well, it's been a pleasure and a delight having you on the show. And thank you so much. I'd love to have you back sometime again, and we can continue talking about all of this stuff. And hey, um, maybe we could have a session on my app, my line of Astral Amway products. You know, I have this <laughs> Astral Amway. If you pay me $20,000, I guarantee that when you die, you'll go right to the top of your pyramid. Oh, well, we'll, yeah. we'll save that for the next show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Raymond. Thank and, you. And um, good fun. night to you, and I guess good night to our listeners. Yeah, and I look folks, forward thank to you very much for listening in, and if you have included I'm crazy, yes, I am. However... <laughs> I'm not really stupid, but I am crazy. It's true. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Lance. Thanks so much. In 1972, and of course that gave me a great opportunity to talk with lots and lots of people who had these experiences. So that's wow. how it all got started. Wow. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> well, it sounds like you were pretty much uh, guided down a, down that path, and <clears throat> thank goodness for all of us because of the you know the enormous body of work that you've created over the years, which you know is it definitely helps all of us. Um, well, you know, Lance, actually, it all comes from my interest in those ancient Greek philosophers, and uh, in 2008 in our society, it's uh, amazing how people generally have lost track of what all that means. But everything that is is essential about the Western society in terms of the logic and the uh, the reasoning process and the accumul- accumulation of rational knowledge. It mm-hmm. all traces back to about 19 or 20 or so uh, individuals in ancient mm-hmm. Greece in the period from about 600 B.C. to about 320 B.C., who mm-hmm. really set the whole foundations for the way that we think about uh, everything in, in the West, and, mm-hmm. and those people were involved in the study of near-death experiences mm-hmm. and, um, and the question of life after death, and uh, they were actually accused by many of their contemporaries of, of evoking the spirits of the dead. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the reason why Socrates got executed was that people thought that he was an evoker of the spirits of the dead, like they had at these uh, oracles of the dead or psychomantions at, a, in ancient Greece. So all of my, uh, my um, books and so on, except for my humor books, have come out of that one little in philosophy. This was 1969. One of my own students came up after class one day, and I course on Plato I was teaching, actually. And I remember, to this day, I remember exactly what he said. He said, um, Dr. Moody, I wish we could talk about life after death in this philosophy course. Huh. And I said, well, why in the world would you want to talk about that? And again, I can quote him exactly. He said, because about a year ago, I was in a bad accident, and my doctors said I died. And I oh. had an experience that has totally changed my life. But I haven't had anybody to talk about it with. Oh, now, my. this young man obviously had severe injuries to his arm. He could hardly move one arm. He limped and sort of almost crawled around sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so the visible evidence of his injury was right there on him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, li- and when I listened to him that afternoon, 
Um, he told me identically what I'd heard from George Ritchie oh. about four years before. And at that point, I knew that there had to be more of them, because if you think about it, um, what's the likelihood that I would have heard the only two of these there were just by, you know, without even really seeking it over a four-year period? Yeah. So yeah. to make a long story short, I just decided to wait and listen, and um, over the three years that I taught at East Carolina University from 69 to 72, quite a number of my students and others in the community, because I started lecturing to various groups like churches and civic clubs around there, uh-huh. and um, began to accumulate a number of cases, and then I had uh, I went back to... Uh, school. I went to the, after that. I uh, went back to medical school to get my MD degree. Wow. A, um, a surgeon, and he had the personality of both of those groups kind of multiplied. Huh. And he, you know, to him, religion was just bunk. And thank God for that, because I'm from the deep south, and if I had been raised up with that, I would have been even more of a wreck now than I was. <laughs> um, but um, but so since I really didn't wasn't exposed to religion um, except peripherally when I was a kid, when I went to the University of Virginia and at age of eighteen in 1962, uh, mm-hmm. I went there to to major in astronomy. Uh, but I had also been very interested in philosophy, and in my first semester at the University of Virginia, one of the first books we were assigned is uh, was Plato's Republic, and Plato's Republic ends with a near-death experience, and um, Plato was the first person I had ever encountered who took the notion of life after death seriously, um, uh. and so... Since I was so impressed by Plato, he's still one of my favorite writers, and I guess in the last 30 years, I, as long as I'm home and, and in my workspace, I'm never more than about 20 or 30 feet away from my complete uh, uh, edition of uh, Plato's works. Mm. And at the end of that dialogue, The Republic, there's this phenomenal story of a man who was believed dead, a warrior, on the mm-hmm. battlefield, who had this astonishing experience. Well, um, everybody, of course, who's read The Republic remembers that, that amazing um, conclusion to it. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, three years later, I, I need to say here that I was in... Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a Fireside Chat with Zany Mystic. I am your host, Lance White. Tonight's guest is Dr. Raymond Moody. Dr. Moody is a best-selling author of 11 books, including Life After Life, which has sold over 13 million copies worldwide. He has appeared three times on Oprah, as well as on hundreds of other programs, such as MSNBC's Grief Recovery, NBC Today, ABC's Turning Point, Donahue, Sally Jesse Raphael Show, Geraldo, and The Joan Rivers Show. Dr. Moody is the leading authority on the near-death experience, a phrase he coined in the late 70s. His research into the phenomenon of near-death experience had its start in the late in the 1960s. So let's uh, get all of those years of experience uh, gar- gathered together in one person and welcome Dr. Moody to the show right now. Hello, uh, Raymond. How are you tonight? Hello. How are you, Lance? Really good to hear from you tonight. Thank you so much for having me on the program. Oh, it's believe me, it's it's a great pleasure to and an honor to have you here tonight. Um, I, in fact, I just had uh, a friend of yours on the show, Daniel Brinkley, mm-hmm. and he was raving about you. I mean, he talked about the old days and how you encouraged him to do this and that, and and I thought, well, gee, I've got to I've got to hear more about that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, well, let's see. Where should we start? Uh, now, going back over the decades. You you were really the pioneer for research in this field. Um, what piqued your interest about life after death originally? I can tell you that answer in one word, Lance, okay. and that is Plato. Um, yeah. 
I I did not grow up religious. My dad was a military off, professional military officer and also an honors student in philosophy at the University of Virginia as an undergraduate. Now I'm not saying that to brag, but just to explain that my last two years uh, at UVA from, as an undergraduate from 64 to 66, my only duties were to go to my tutor once a week mm. and uh, read a paper to him on some philosophical topic that I had uh, that he had assigned me. And then um, I had free reign. I could go to all the graduate courses in philosophy. So during mm. one of those courses in 1965 called the Philosophical Topics, uh, Professor John Marshall uh, mentioned one evening that right there in Charlottesville uh, at the medical school was Dr. George Ritchie, who was a psychiatry professor there, who some years before had actually been pronounced dead on two mm. occasions about nine minutes apart. His, his heart had stopped beating at least for nine minutes. And um, so Dr. Ritchie was very open to talking with students, and he often talked around the the University of Virginia to various student groups, and so I took that opportunity in 1965 to hear Dr. Ritchie, and I mean, I can still remember that night just like it was last night, uh, oh. and the fact that he was such an obviously reliable and deep and warm-hearted man um, uh. who had everything to lose and nothing to gain by by talking casually about this, mm -hmm. um, he, uh, when I heard it from Dr. Ritchie, that was the first living person I'd ever heard such a thing from, mm -hmm. and it was really startling to me because I realized at that point that it wasn't just an ancient Greek phenomenon. And then, about four years later, after I'd gotten my Ph.D.